Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the 18 Strong Podcast. This week, we are talking to Kai Golby, shaper, golf course, golf course designer, and uh, a gentleman that I just recently had a chance to play nine holes of golf with. And uh, I'm really excited to dig into, this is going to be a little different episode than we normally do on the 18 Strong Podcast, talking a little bit more about golf architecture, golf design, golf shaping, and what goes into kind of building all of these courses that we see. We know that, you know, these courses are being built or courses are being renovated, but what really goes into that? And um, it was fun to get to pick Kai's brain a little bit when we played, but this is going to be even more fun to, to be able to dig a little bit deeper. So let me bring in our special guest. Kai, welcome to the 18 Strong Podcast. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So, so pretty much, Kai, you get to uh, dig in the dirt and play on big, huge toys, which is kind of like every little boy's dream. But give us a little idea of, of what exactly it is that a shaper does and maybe what's the difference between that and a designer? Because I think that, you know, sometimes we get a little those misconstrued as far as, you know, what the designer does, what the shaper does. Well, you know, there's when you talk about the roles, there's different different ways, excuse me, <clears throat> losing my voice. There's sort of different ways of building a golf course. And with me, I started out trying to do it with plans and everything. And it just looked like when you would try to give a bulldozer operator, my first job I was on, it was actually a union road building crew. And trying to explain golf to those guys was pretty hard. And it was like, man, that would be fun. Just like you mentioned, the toys, it'd be pretty fun just to be able to build it yourself and not get all this stuff lost in translation. So I kind of, I couldn't draw worth crap anyway. So I kind of got into it that way. And working with guys like Tom Doak, who I've worked with a lot over the past 25, really 30 years now, no, 25, excuse me. Um, Tom, Gil Hance, who I just recently have worked with some, Bill Core, the guys that are really, out there that people are they're building the new golf courses now kind of the top guys in the field the shaping and the design are sort of intermingled in the sense that you know gil will get on the dozer and build the greens himself which is what shaping is when tom started he was his first course he built the greens and the bunkers himself with the bulldozer so some guys those guys the bill cores guys Bill gets on machines, he gets on a trap rake and floats out the green. So there's not this perfect separation within I, who I think the best guys are. Um, you might go to an old school method, something like a Robert Trent Jones Jr., Robert Trent Jones Sr., whatever. They send out a set of plans to a construction company who has bid on the project. And then that company has different levels of skilled people on the machines and the shaper usually is their quote best guy and he can build the greens the tees the bunkers those kind of things the features of the golf course so anyway it's a kind of a long drawn out way of saying it but the the guys that are doing it now and they all kind of learn from pete Dye, who sort of did this in the field also wasn't really a set of drawings that you were following to a t and all these guys that came off the pete Dye tree it's sort of shaping and design can sort of intermingle in working with Tom Doak a lot over the years, you know, Tom will give us concepts. We'll have a routing plan. And, but when we go out to a green, there's no stakes in the ground or anything like that. It's just, Hey, we want the green to sit over on that Ridge and the Ridge might need to come down about a foot or two. And we want the shot. If you hit it in the right side of the fairway, you should have a good approach to this part of the green. And it should hold, but if you're over here, it might run away from you a little bit. And so we just talk about concepts, or we might say, hey, this is going to be something like the fifth green at Marion. And if you're experienced and have some knowledge of those things, you can then incorporate that. So there's a little bit of design in the shaping, and uh, the shaping also adds to the design. So I don't know if that answers it, but it's, uh, I don't think it's totally separate. And to me, I like, I just was working on some routing plans, but knowing how to build things helps you when you're doing the routing, because you can look at contour map, contour lines in the topo map 
and realize, okay, I can just take the dozer and kind of knock that out in an hour. And so it, what like, looked like a steep spot on the topo map, I know I can quickly fix that and make it really cool just from experience. So, And obviously you've been working with these, these guys a long time. You've done um, designing on your own. Is it something where you have a lot of freedom uh, to use your own creativity when you're working with these guys, or does that kind of depend on the crew that you're working with, the guy that you're working with? when you're getting out to these different projects? Most of the time that people are hiring me, I think they know a little bit of what my skills are these days. So I get a lot of freedom to do things. Now, you know, if working with Doak, he might have a green, hey, that green's just sitting there. I just want to kind of use that land. Don't get creative on me here. And, you know, we all understand that. But there's other times just like, yeah, the green's going to go here and you know, if you get a little carried away, or, hey, I think the green would be kind of cool 50 feet further over that way. I'll do that. We'll see what Tom has to say about it or what Gil has to say about it. And if they don't like it, the bulldozer is a really big eraser. So you can get rid of stuff real fast yeah. and yeah. put it right back. You know, you, if you move 10 days of dirt or something, but if you're just moving a foot or two of dirt here or there, it's not a big deal. So. Now, how did you how did you get into this? Obviously, you come from a, a family of golfers. You've been kind of in the golf world for a long time, but you definitely took a different route than than some of the other guys in your family tree. So, when did this occupation start? When did you get into the the, the designing or even just the idea of building golf courses? Well, I saw you actually had my cousin Jerry Haas on one of your podcasts yeah. maybe three or four years ago on here, and. Uh, so Jerry and I grew up together and played golf at Wake Forest together. Jerry was actually good. I wasn't. <laughs> um, so Jerry had a hand and let me know I wasn't good enough at, to play golf. And also being around him, he was really dedicated to playing golf. I was not. And so I was, you know, in college realizing, yeah, I'm not, I'm not cut out for playing for sure. So uh, anyway, it kind of got started when I got out of school. I really wasn't playing golf and I went to Boston to work for Fidelity Investments thinking I was going to get into the financial business and make a bunch of money. And uh, anyway, that was not my cup of tea. And fortunately, my dad got a job to help some guys do a design of a golf course in Belleville, Illinois, where I grew up. And I quit the job up in Boston and came to work for five, six bucks an hour on that golf course. So that's how I got started. And then you just started building that golf course and then just kind of kept on going? Or did, did you then seek out other architects to start working? Oh, yeah, with that them? was that where the union guys were. You know, it was, it was absolutely forbidden for me to even think about getting on a piece of equipment on that okay. job. And I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't even know how to start it anyway. But uh, that was kind of how it got going. And I did some projects – you and I are both in St. Louis here around this area for three or four years. The early nineties were kind of a boom time for golf. There was golf courses just being built everywhere around here and around the United States as well. And I was in a situation and I worked with a guy that did the shaping at the orchards, which was that first project in Belleville, Illinois. And he and I did some other golf courses around the area and then in 1990, the fall of 93, this, the orchards happened in 1990. In the fall of 93, he and I got a job to build a golf course up in central Illinois. And so I did a design for that. That was the first time I did the routing and then basically shaped the whole thing myself, more or less. And that's kind of how I got going in that. And did a few more projects, did one with my dad here in Illinois in this area. And after that, I just kind of was realizing I had some different ideas and started reaching out to people. I re got a hold of Bill Core and Tom Doak and uh, Pete Dye. And Tom kind of got back to me and wanted me to come help him on a job out in Arizona. So that's kind of how that shifted into, you know, 20 years working with Tom. And have you still been doing much design or are you more in the shaping role or like have you have you oh, had I've been doing more shaping i guess the last oh 15 years and but at you know i've worked with tom doke a lot on the end that time i've worked with uh gil hance some the last three or four years 
um, on about four or five projects. And I've worked with a few other guys as well. I work with Brian Silva, actually here in St. Louis, at St. Louis Country Club. And then I've also done a few of my own, probably five or six of my own jobs at the same time. Um, last year, two years ago, did a nine hole renovation. There's a lot of renovation work today as opposed to new golf courses. There's not a lot of new stuff. And what is new tends to be Tom Doak, Gil Hans, Bill Core. Right. Um, so, you know, you're not, if you, if I was out trying to build new courses on my own, I'd probably be broke. So working with those guys is fantastic because I get to work in New Zealand at Terry Eady with Tom Doak or last year at Oakland Hills, redoing Oakland Hills with Gil Hans, you know, just great projects that, I would never get to do on my own. But a couple of years ago, I did a nine hole renovation in Saratoga Springs, New York. And it was a really cool old golf course. It was built in 1896. And, you know, it was my, my redesign, but I tried to kind of lead the course. You know, it had a hundred plus years of history. I didn't want to just blow it up. So anyway, that course was just ranked the 11th best nine hole course in the world after we got done. So that was kind of cool. And uh, working on a few, things of my own right now and also talking with Gil and with Tom about doing projects with them. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of everything, but keeps me happy and keeps me busy. What does your travel schedule look like? Cause you, you mentioned, you know, projects all over the place. I mean, all over the world really. Um, and I know you've been to Scotland, New Zealand. What does your travel look like? How do you manage these different projects? Is it one project at a time and, and how do you balance that? Yeah, my, my travel has become more one place at a time. Up until about 2008, we used to kind of be jumping, coming home, fly. It was a like business was kind of crazy with Tom. We would just fly out, work a couple of weeks, fly back, maybe go somewhere else for a week and work and go back to the other place. And just it was a little more traveling back and forth home. For whatever reason, after 2008, when the business got back going, it's been more staying on site longer times. I think it's just, there's less work going on. So you're not trying to jump between projects. And so I've been on the road a lot, but I tend to be somewhere and stay somewhere for quite a while. And part of that shaping design question you're asking is the people that are hiring me, I'm there every day. So I'm sort of the eyes and ears of the design when they're not there, you know, if the designer can be there one day a week or two days a month or something, and I'm there 30 days in a row for the whole month, I'm going to see a lot more details and catch little things to make sure they're done right. than the person, if the designer shows up and there's 30 things he wants to change, the project's going to cost more and it's going to take a lot more time to try to redo things. And you're going to get behind schedule. So anyway, my travel schedule this year was a little less hectic, but the two years before, I think I was on the road 275 days and 303 days. So <laughs> that was like either that was days I didn't sleep in my bed at home. So, oh my gosh, uh, it was kind of it was, you know, a lot when I added it up the one of the 303 days, I, was like, oh, I wasn't home very much. And I started adding it up. And I was like, that's kind of insane. And uh, so. You but mentioned that you guys just did the uh, the Oakland Hills project, and and I, to be honest, don't know a whole lot about that project. But can you give us an idea, like what's the scope of what you guys did, and how long did it take, and and what does that process look like? Like how involved are you at the beginning, or when do you find out kind of what your role is going to be, and what you what you're going up there to change and shape? Yeah, that job. If the so people listening to this don't know Oakland Hills history, it's been hosting us open since usga hosting usga events since the 1920s and it was kind of famous in 1951 for being the monster when ben hogan won the us open robert trent jones had redesigned what was a donald ross course built in 1916 and that's when ben hogan said he brought this monster to its knees and it kind of became it got known because of that. It's sort of, and so it's held quite a few U S open since then and Ryder cups and different, you know, all kinds of events. Anyway, over the years, they kept trying to fiddle with the golf course, I think to make it more difficult. And over time they just went too far. It's like plastic surgery right. on an actress. It's just, okay, you, 
kind of jumped the shark there. You've got way too much. You were beautiful. Now it's kind of gross. Um, so Oakland Hills had sort of gotten into that realm and they hired Gil a few years back to come in and put back, just get it back to what Donald Ross had. And so I wasn't involved in Gil's master planning whatsoever. Um, Gil's really busy and we had a few conversations and they could really have used the help this year. And he was working at Baltus Rall and Oakland Hills and Oakland Hills being a little closer to here. And my dad also finished second in the U S open there in 1960. 61. I I believe. 61, yeah. And I'd heard stories about that my whole life, him telling me about how he lost by one and people were congratulating him that he had won the tournament because they used to play 36 holes on Saturday to finish the U.S. Open. So you didn't really play with the final group. No, you know, you could make a big move playing 36 holes, obviously. Right. So he finished, I don't know, an hour ahead of Gene Littler, who won. And most of the people were like, oh, you know, he's never going to finish even par to finish and beat you you're you know he's gonna play a couple over because that was the monster and all that anyway Littler finished one under for the last five holes I think and so my dad lost by a shot but I heard all about it for quite a few years well my whole life so going up there to work was kind of cool for me anyway so what the job entailed was Trent Jones had changed the bunkering and tweaked a few greens but he didn't change it a ton, but then Reese Jones, his son, has come in a couple times since then and kept trying to make the course harder by just adding more bunkers and adding more bunkers. Like, oh, the drives are going from, they used to go 270, now they're going 290. So we're going to add more bunkers and we're going to put them on both sides of the fairway instead of one. Now they're hitting at 320. Well, we're going to add another set of bunkers. So all of a sudden you had these golf holes that were just lined with not the most artistic bunkers. It's like the bunkers on a the one at 320 is on a down slope that you couldn't see it behind the one at 290. So they just built a big mound up and jacked a bunker into it that didn't fit any of the landforms. And effectively what it did is the pros aren't stupid. They just stay away from all that. If you line the fairways, they're 25 yards wide or something with bunkers on both sides. They'll just kind of sit back where there's a little more room and just avoid that. And the golf course just became not much fun. The bunkering around the greens got way at just tons of bunkers added. They didn't fit the land anymore. So anyway, what Gill's plan did was just put the Ross back. And it was really cool as we sort of erased and wiped out the stuff to see the landforms that Ross had originally created start popping again. And so that was the big part of the project. A lot of trees came down. There was a just a lot of trees planted over the years that had grown a lot and started infringing on play. Just there wasn't much freedom to play golf and freedom to get in trouble. You know, you kind of, it's kind of like kicking a field goal. You know what I mean? Just, you have things on both sides and you kind of just, it gives you a good idea where to hit the ball. Um, so we removed all, a lot of trees, widened fairways in a few spots. And then Gil came in basically 12, 13 different times. And we stripped the grass off portions of the greens, filled bunkers in that were added and sort of put the bunk the greens back to the expansion, expanded them back out to where they originally were. And sometimes where there was bunkers cut in, that's where we would fill those bunkers. And Gil spent a lot of times tying in all those expansions and, Every very few times did we come in and lower, just tweak something, to make it pinnable. Because in the old days, things were a lot slower on the green, so slopes were steeper. But we didn't do much of that because the greens are just fantastic at Oakland. I was dumbfounded when I got there; I had no idea what was really there. I hadn't seen it, and the greens are amazing. And Gil did a fantastic job of getting them back, and we all helped. I mean, we participated with him, and. Also, the maintenance crew at Oakland Hills was, you know, irreplaceable in their help that they gave Gil with that, too, that he had a crew of guys that worked with him. So it was hand raking and shoveling and just a lot of little bits detail work. But it, the greens are back to you look at the old pictures and there we had a bunch of old pictures from 1929 women's U.S. amateur. And 
we use those to put the greens back. So they look really similar to what was there. And you know, it's so it's an expensive process and it takes a long time. I mean, we had, you know, 50 or 60 guys out there for five months. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of new drainage in there. We had to remove lakes that Reese Jones put in and turn that back into a creek. And just a lot, there's a lot of work that went into it, but it's pretty cool now. What does a project like that cost ballpark? Well, that one costs a little more because they did something called precision air, which is basically an HVAC system that goes underneath the greens. Mm -hmm. So you can heat and cool the greens as well as suck the moisture out from them. So those are really expensive and that might add a couple two to three million dollars to the overall cost by the time you install it and get the power to it. But you know, I think that project overall might have cost ten to twelve million dollars. Um you know we've built a lot of golf courses brand new that are really, really good golf courses that cost much less than that. So sometimes retrofitting is actually harder than starting from scratch. You mentioned that a lot of the projects these days, um, outside of some of the, the bigger name architects are mostly renovations. And it seems to me like a lot of them, a lot of these renovations are saying like, Hey, let's go back to the way that the original guy designed it. Is, is that kind of what you're seeing that, throughout time golf courses tried to just either make things harder or just kind of added things frivolously. And now a lot of you guys are trying to go back and, and almost bring it back to the original pureness of the way that the, the architects brought it forth. If the golf course has the pedigree that it's worth taking it back to what the original guy did. Yeah. There's a lot of that happening. Some of that's keeping up with the Joneses, you know, everybody, Oh, they're, they did that. And it, it, the golf course is a lot more interesting now just getting on old golf courses where the greens shrink, there might be 20 or 30 feet on a corner of a green that's just rounded off over the years. The mower just goes around and you lose an inch this year, you lose an inch next year. And, you know, 30 years later, you've lost, you know, feet. So just getting some pin placements back really does help, but it's a pretty common thing that's happening these days. Um, and I think the problem is over the years, you have at private clubs, you have green committees that, you know, each green committee is on for two years and they want to make their mark. So they decide they're going to do this or we're going to we're going to add a bunker in front of the green on the front left because that guy I play with, he hits a slice in there and he bounces it in there all the time. And that pisses me off. So I'm going to put a bunker there. And it's a lot of these selfish thoughts or they want to you know, make it harder. So we're going to plant some trees or we're going to put a bunker in while the trees grow for 50 years. And all of a sudden you can't even play the hole at all. So a lot of things like that happen, but it's just like your house too. If you live in a house that's 70 years old, some things are going to need renewal. And uh, so it's a little bit of all those things, but there's a lot of green committee errors over the years that keeps us really busy. So I should probably send thank you notes to those guys because it keeps us real busy. Now, when somebody's building a new course, um, obviously the the PGA Tour golf is way different than, you know, general public golf, member golf. When you're building something big, like a, like a Bally Neal or a Sabonic or something like that, is it meant more to be built for the general public or are there thoughts in there uh, for what the tour might need if there was ever to be some sort of an event there, or what's the differences between, you know, the tour golf and what a course needs for tour golf versus general public golf to make it enjoyable. I honestly think Oakland Hills was the first golf course I've ever worked on in 30 plus years where the tour players game was ever really talked about. Um, and that's something that's cool working with Doak. It's, it's usually just, Hey, this, we're just making this golf course for the average golfer, you know? And when we started, honestly, the difference in the tour player and the average golfer 30 years ago, wasn't quite as extreme as it is today. Right. Um, but like I said, Oakland Hills was the first time we really, really talked about that at the, almost in every conversation because they wanted to get the U S open back. And, you know, it was a bit frustrating because, while we're doing this, this year's U.S. Open obviously got pushed back. 
until the fall. And as we were finishing up, they played at Wingfoot and Gil Hans had redone Wingfoot. And just watching what happened to that golf course with DeChambeau and other guys, just the distance people are hitting it. You know, we're out working on these holes and we're like, you know, does it even matter what we're doing? Because if a guy hits it 350, they're talking about getting the U.S. Open in 2029 or 2030. And it's like, what's going to happen 10 years from now? Yeah. And we're like, does it matter? We've got a 570 yard par five and we're talking about things about the second shot. And if a guy hits his drive 370 and the hole's 570, he's got 200. That for those guys, that's an eight iron, you know. Yeah. So it's a okay. we've got the driver eight iron hole. And you know, at that point, the rough hardly matters when you're hitting an eight iron because the loft. And so it was kind of mind-boggling watching that thing at at Wingfoot while we're doing spending all this money at Oakland Hills and you know, you're just like, please, God, let them do something about how far the golf ball goes. Because if they're hitting it 400 yards, I mean, no, there is no such thing as a par five at that point. Right. I mean, or you'd have to take the driver out of their hands. And then that's no fun for the member, the other 361 days of the year. So um, anyway, I got, I got a little sidetracked there, but. As far as building the golf courses, the, most of the time, and you know, I'm using Doak a lot because I worked with him a lot. But as Tom would say a lot, he was like, you know, Bobby Jones, the golf course when it was built, if Bobby Jones was the best player in the 1920s, your average member is pretty much hitting the ball the same distance today. So you're getting to play effectively what Bobby Jones was playing. So it's still working for 90. 98% of the players and the really good golf courses have really good greens. The distance is sort of negated by the good green contours where you have to come in from the right angle. So those old golf courses are the new ones that I've worked on with Tom or Gill. You can still defend par just by having some really great greens. I'm curious. So you come from a family of, of a lot of tour players. You are on the other side, you know, it's almost like the, the architect, the shapers, the designers are the ones defending the course. The the players are the ones trying to attack the course. Do you have you ever had conversations with either your dad or your cousins or um, any of those guys on you know what they consider a good golf course versus what you consider a good golf course? I, I'm curious if the, if you guys would go out and play, you know what differing opinions you guys would have on what's what's a good hole, what's a bad hole, or, or something like that. Yeah, I've had quite a few of those conversations and for the most part there's a lot of agreement now i might like something really quirky like if i was at north barrack i might think or i do think and i won't don't might but a lot of the holes there that someone might think are those are nuts those holes aren't you know that hole the redan hole is not a great hole or the 17th hole with the green up on top of a ridge or the 14th hole where it's kind of blind over down into a bowl as a really good player, they might not enjoy it as much as me because their skill is sort of being negated and luck is getting a little more involved. Now, what's interesting about that is the skill does come into play combined with thinking. Cause if you know, you can get in trouble and they're good enough to hit it where you're not going to be recovery is not going to be a problem they can just slide through that hole and not make a big number and just move on. And the conversations with the design, with those guys, they tend to agree. My dad, Jay, Jerry, you know, none of those guys are huge long hitters. My dad was long for his day, but they all think the length the ball's going is taking away from the game because when they played, you know, a good player still had to be able to hit long irons and be able to stay in the fairway. Cause if you're trying to hit a four iron out of the rough, that wasn't the same as hitting a wedge out of the rough. So everyone is still in agreement that as far as design goes, that the distance is an issue. Um, but the biggest difference is I might like a green with a little more contour than they may prefer that can make them look bad or, you know, doesn't maybe reward 
the shot the way they would like it to, that I can't fly it right at the hole. I might have to bounce it down a slope to get close, which is funny because that's what happens at Augusta. And everybody loves that. So, right. Well, that kind of reminds me. So you and I, we had a chance to play nine holes at Sweetens Cove. And obviously there, the, you know, the green contours and everything are, are much like what you're talking about. But what I noticed when we were playing is, is you were kind of walking around, hitting putts from different areas. So I'm curious, when you go to a, a new golf course, what is it that you kind of start scoping out? You know, like for, for me, with my background in physical therapy, like I just naturally notice like if somebody's limping or somebody walks a little differently or something yeah. like that. So I'm sure there's things that, that I would never see when I'm staying on a tee box or walking through a fairway, but things that just you pick up without even thinking about it. What are some of those things that the, the natural golfer wouldn't see? On a new golf course, it's probably you bringing it up before the shaping, knowing how people worked with the land. And if, if you can really tell what they did, because one of the biggest with shaping, one of the best compliments I think, you could give is I can't tell you did anything that it's, it just looks like it's been there forever. And there's really, it's like, well, I don't think you did anything here, but actually we did a lot, but you can't tell. Um, if I can see a lot of things on the golf course where it was like, you know, that's kind of obvious or that doesn't look like that doesn't look like nature put it there. Those are maybe the first things I might notice. And then the next thing is probably the greens how the greens work um really good greens you're not going to get a bad golf course that has really good greens probably and so what you're talking about sweetens cove i was just seeing how okay if you missed over here where's the ball going to go if i'm coming this way and so you know the, the naturalness of the shaping and the greens contouring is probably the first thing i'll notice and i think you almost notice it without thinking how the routing works if if the golf sort of fits and you don't have to walk a long way or if it's a golf course you have to get in a cart and drive 250 yards to the next tee then i'm like oh this is not going to be enjoyable for me i'm just like you obviously weren't focused on a nice simple walking golf course so those when are the you, primary things when you go to a, a, a new course or i mean it could be an old course but maybe even new to you are you the kind of guy that can visually like just remember everything about the different holes uh, me personally i can play 18 holes and you ask me what the fourth hole was and it i i go blank and have to like retrace my steps but are you somebody that you take that all that in and you're able to, to kind of see that and talking about the routing and everything you know some places i can some places i can't it's and i i used to think it was always the best golf courses I can remember it just, it just sticks. It's just, I can remember that. Um, either lately getting older, maybe my mind's slipping, but uh, <laughs> there's, there's a few places that I've played recently that I couldn't remember every hole. I remember I first time I played Pinehurst number two and I got done. Oh, I'd actually played it in college a few times, but it was quite a bit different after Bill Core and Ben Crenshaw redid it. Just, it looked different. It wasn't different, but it looked different. And a couple of the holes I kind of spaced when I got done. I couldn't remember. I was like, well, there goes the theory that if it's a really good golf course, you should remember it all. Um, the first time I played St. Andrews, I had a hard time remembering every hole. Um, where else was I just re – oh, I just was at Royal Melbourne. It was the second time, and a couple of the holes at Royal Melbourne kind of ran together for me. I had to kind of go back and go through the round at the end to make sure I got the holes again. But So – I used to be able to remember, I guess, better, but for sure, a really great golf course, as opposed to just sort of, a, you know, if I played something in Scottsdale that was just an average golf course, I probably wouldn't remember the holes. So I probably wouldn't be paying attention. Is there a certain style that you like to implement when you're on a project or are you kind of pretty versatile and you like trying new things or doing different things? Or is there a certain, you know, way of a golf course that kind of suits your eye? Um, you know, something that's natural, I think would suit my, I think number one, things looking natural. It's at least between the green and the, the between the T and the green, the, just a rolling natural contour. If it's a bunch of artificial things that we were talking about a little bit at Sweetens Cove, if you see, if I see a bunch of catch basins in the ground where the, the surface drainage has been altered and now they're trying to pick it up in 
underground pipe all the time and you have the little wet spot from the grate i'll see that and i'm like Ugh. and that's something i try to avoid at all costs building a golf course but for style wise if just we were just talking about this the other day on a project natural drainage doesn't break if if the surface drainage has been working for eons for a million years and you don't change it it's not going to break like if you put a bunch of pipe in the ground you're trying to run water at some point something's going to go wrong and so if you can leave surface drainage as it is that makes it look natural and it works better um the other things as far as style goes i mean i like a bunch of different styles and i think your you know ideas change when i was working at say bally neal or when dope built pacific dunes and the bunkering with those kind of big blowout sand bunkers wow that's awesome to be able to build stuff or working at pasta tiempo where mckenzie built what i thought were some of the coolest bunkers i'd ever seen early in my career and those kind of jigsaw puzzle bunkers you know oh that's, that's such a cool style now if i was building something i don't know if i don't prefer something really simple or no bunkers um still like dramatic big features but maybe not the frilly bunker and that's sort of the first thing someone notices of a golf course the bunker style it might not have any bearing on how the golf course plays but you notice that and uh but really i i'm pretty versatile in styles i've worked on a lot of different types of golf courses i work on alistair mckenzie courses like i said with the fingery bunkers um the stuff at Oakland Hills we did was really just real simple, big, giant, kind of simple bunkers, just almost like giant Tic Tacs in places. <laughs> um, you know, then I've worked on William Langford golf courses quite a few times, and he's just got these big grass face bunkers. And a lot of times there's no sand in the bottom. You just have a 12 foot grass bank with a grass bottom. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of variety. That thing in Saratoga Springs, I did. We didn't really do a lot. We did a few bunkers, but mostly built mounds, just kind of old school. Like in the old days, they'd build golf courses. And if they built it on rocky ground, they had to get rid of the rocks and they didn't have money to haul it away or bury it. So they just piled them up and threw a little dirt on top and threw some grass seed. And there was your, your hazard was up in the air instead of in the ground. So, you know, we did that. And that's the cool thing about golf. I mean, you know, there's a lot of variety and to get caught up into one style, I only do this kind of boring. What's the hardest thing to do when you're out there with the equipment? I mean, what is it, is it bunkering? Is it shaping greens? Is there something that, that you look at as the biggest challenge that you face? Uh, I, nothing's like, Oh my God, that's so difficult. But the greens are the thing that if you, you know, if a bunker doesn't quite have the right look, Oh, I just, I wish I would have had the sand line an extra six inches higher, that's not really going to change the way the golf course plays. It's an aesthetic that you're like, man, I could have done that a little better. Or I really got that right. But if you get the green not exactly right, it's it's pretty much going to affect the golf for the rest of the t that time that course exists unless someone fixes it. So the green's the most important thing. you got to get that right. And, you know, what makes a good green? We could probably have a, a podcast with 20 golf course architects and could go on for days. You know, what makes a great green, but the great greens are what make a great golf course. There's no great golf course without a set of great greens. I mean, they're just, it doesn't exist. So, you know, and I think when you talk about design, a lot of the design works backwards from the green, you kind of the green dictates how your strategy works. So if your green's really dull and boring and it doesn't dictate any strategy, well, you've kind of, you've lost right off the bat. So the greens are the most important thing. It might not be the most difficult, but you that's where the most, it's the most fun and it's the most maybe stressful because you have to get it right. Is that what you would say possibly separates the best shapers in, in the business? I mean, obviously I, I already know you're not a guy that would toot your own horn, but obviously you've got some pretty, pretty big names calling you to do work. What is it that, that they know that you're going to be able to deliver um, as opposed to, you know, I'm sure there's, there's plenty of other guys that they could call. Well, I think 
having golf knowledge helps, you know, as you mentioned, growing around the golf family. So that helps a little bit, but you know, it's not the main reason, but being able to build cool greens and coming up with ideas that, you know, maybe the, when you're just trying to draw something on paper, sometimes it doesn't flow like it does in the field. You get out there and you're, Hey, that's that place. That I just gouged that hole out to get that stump out of the ground. Looks kind of cool. If we, if we kept working with that, we might be able to make a cool little Valley in the green or, you know, just little things that happen. And I think guys trust me with that. And as I mentioned, I'm, being on the road 303 days, they know I'm going to work. <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not going to slack off. So, uh, um, you know, there's, there's other guys that are really fantastic at this. I work with the guys at Renaissance, Brian Schneider, Eric Iverson and Brian Slonick are all fantastic at building greens. Um, Jim Wagner, who works with Gil Hans, I was just down in a hoopy right before I saw you at Sweden's Cove and Jim built a green. They have four extra holes at a hoopy. And it's A, B, C, D. And Jim built the hole they called A hole, which <laughs> <laughs> no gym is perfect. And, uh, but the green Jim built on that thing is unbelievably cool. And, you know, Jim's and Guild can shape too. So, I mean, there's a lot of guys that can build greens that are, but, you know, maybe I fit in the handful of guys that are pretty good at it. So, um, I don't, I don't really know how that works that I've, figured out how to do it a little bit but i think it's willing to take chances now and then and sort of knowing what's too much and i think tom doke helped me with that because when you go too far he's the first to tell you and uh but he doesn't want to he doesn't want you to not go too far either because it's like you know stay stay aggressive stay creative don't get scared to to try something and so what's know, what's that, one project that, that you have like the maybe not the fondest of memories but but like a kind of an eye-opening project that maybe was a a career changer or something that really struck you that still sits with you today yeah as far as career changer i obviously the first time i worked with dope i think was probably pretty important and tom was not very well known at that time i mean this was 1997 um Pacific Dunes had not been built, still four years away. But just talking to Tom out there and seeing him be way more creative than I was even used to doing. And I think part of that was, I've said this before to people, but growing up with my dad as a golf pro and working on my first golf courses with him, this is back to the question you had mentioned before you didn't get too wild and crazy. And I didn't really know you could, I guess. Um, so doing some things with the land and building greens on landforms that I was like, Holy cow, that's, I wouldn't have thought of that. That meant a lot. And watching Tom also spend a lot of time thinking about chipping and recovery around the greens, which is something I hadn't thought about either at that time. I was thinking more about, okay, I'm on the green and I'm putting. You know, are my shots coming in from over here? How's this going to react and hold the, the shot coming in? I hadn't thought a ton about how the recovery shots were happening and what would happen if you missed over there, blah, blah, blah. So that was a big part of it. Um, probably working at Bally Neal was the first time I got to work on just sand, and that was – a pretty eye-opening experience as well. And fortunately I've gotten to work on a bunch of sand since then. Now you mentioned, you know, obviously growing up with your dad playing on the tour, what was, what was the, the best part of being the son of a tour player, masters winner and, and being in this family of tour players. And what was maybe the hardest part of, of being in that family as well? Yeah, the best part, I think, you know, my dad was gone a lot, but, you know, we, there was a lot of fringe benefits that went with that. I mean, you know, getting to go to the Masters. I can remember, like, flying around with him when I was pretty young, going to different tournaments. Um, I think I was, like, 11 or 10. I remember going down to Doral to the tournament with him. I flew down by myself and met him down there. I remember it was, you know, 
getting rained out they got rained out a day and we were out fishing on some there's like some little island with monkeys on it at doral back in the day and <laughs> you know we were fishing in this lake by this monkey island and we were on tv for like 20 minutes because the tournament was in like rained out so they just showed us fishing on tv you know not a lot of 10 year olds get to be on tv fishing when so uh just stuff like that i mean i got to play golf with sam sneed um you know a bunch of different guys on the golf tour um you know, we went to Disney World tournament and hanging out with Jack Nicholas and his family for the week. Just, you know, things like that that you don't really get to do, obviously, as a normal kid. And I didn't know that much of a difference. I knew I had some advantages, but, you know, you didn't maybe realize the extent of it. Um, and, you know, I got a hell of a lot of good golf lessons just from my dad, just so, and they weren't formal golf lessons. I think I heard you talking to Jerry on Jerry Hobbs on the podcast and, you know, it wasn't, it was sort of just a little, one little swing tip here, one little swing tip there, you know, maybe strengthen your grip or take it away a little slower or outside, but nothing, you know, it wasn't a bunch of complex ideas, um, which I think are easier to understand from a golf swing standpoint. As far as what was the most difficult part? I think as a kid, the most difficult part was just sort of being in Belleville, Illinois. I started school as a kindergartner the year after he won the masters in Belleville is a pretty small town. And so, you know, there was a bit of a spotlight. I was the oldest kid also. And so there was a bit of a spotlight on you. So you couldn't maybe get away with things like other kids might, you kind of got noticed. So, that was the one thing as a kid. I was like, I wish people wouldn't notice what I was doing. So now yeah. you mentioned no, that's not that bad of a problem. To have. Yeah, no, uh, but, but I totally, I totally get it. You mentioned having, um, you know, it's just some swing tips here and there and getting a chance to, um, you know, be around some of the tour players. I, I heard that there's a story of, of Sam Sneed watching you hit some golf balls that I think the audience would like to hear from when you were down at Augusta one year. Yeah, that was, I think I mentioned that in the uh, golf club Atlas interview. So, yeah. So a few times when I, I think that year, uh, was that the year that I went to, I think it was. So my dad was, I was with my dad and I was caddying for him as a kid. Maybe I was 14 and I was at the Greensboro open with him and we, he missed the cut. So we came down to Augusta a couple of days early and so we're there for Saturday and Sunday before the Masters started because he had missed the cut the previous week. And so the best part of that this story I didn't mention, but I got to play out of his bag at Augusta during the Masters like pre-practice round thing. And so the first hole I didn't hit a tee shot, but then I my dad's like, if Clifford Roberts sees you, you know, I'm out of here. So just be, <laughs> don't even think about hitting a, a shot here. So on the first fairway after we got out there. I hit from where he did and I played around and I didn't, I didn't hit into nine green or putt and then played around and then <clears throat> on 18, I hit a drive and picked up. So make sure Clifford Robert didn't see me, but I got to play Augusta, which was pretty cool, you know? And then, uh, so that same week, I think it was probably the Monday or Tuesday, the driving range at Augusta, if people have been down there recently, they see this giant practice facility, but the, range used to be just behind the clubhouse right along magnolia lane and they had to move it because guys were hitting it over the fence into the road but at that time you'd go out and your caddy would take the players brought their own shag bag i think this was like 1970 probably 1977 and so my dad goes out to the range of the shag bag the, his caddy dumps his balls in the tee and goes out in the range to kind of you know pick up his balls as he hit them and so my dad's like, Hey, hit a couple shots. And then I'm like, no, I'm not gonna hit a couple. So he's like, yeah, I just hit a couple. And then Sam Sneed had been playing with my dad and Sam was doing something. Then Sam comes walking out on the range tee and he's like, yeah, let Sam watch you hit a few more. And so I think I had a seven iron. And so Sam watched me hit a couple. And I just remember that I was already upset because the, the caddies out there and all the pros are literally dropping shots at their caddies feet, like one hop. And they just could catch it on one hop or take a half a step to the right or to the left. 
and just put it right in the bag. I mean, every shot, they just drop right there. And I'm hitting it 20 yards right of him, 10 yards short of him, five yards over his head. And I'm already like, oh, man, this is embarrassing. So anyway, Sam comes up and he's like, ah, come on, boy. You got to get a little more into that. Release them hips. Let them hips, release them <laughs> hips a little better. And so, you know, I'm standing there and I start, I start doing it a little bit. And right about that time, so I hear this noise. And I think in the golf club, Alice, I mentioned it sounded like some sort of herd of elephants or something. I didn't know what it was. It was just like this roar NASCAR thing. And so what it was, was there's a gallery of a grandstand behind the range. And there was like three people in this grandstand while my dad and Sam and maybe somebody else was hitting balls over there. So Nicholas comes walking out and this is, you know, Jack with the flowing long blonde hair and the plaid pants and the big collar shirt and all that. And literally the stands went from empty to full in about, I don't know, 30 seconds. It seemed like and the noise of people filing in and, jack comes out and so he has to walk right by us to go to where he's going to go hit balls and he stops he sees a 13 year old kid and my dad's like no oh, let, let, let maybe jack can see something here and so now i'm thinking about sam telling me to release my hips and i'm just i'm i'm freaking <laughs> out i'm losing my mind and so i start trying to release my hips and the you know your guys listening know if you open your hips up a little bit and you're probably nervous as hell i start shanking so I shanked the first one right into Magnolia Lane. <laughs> and it's it's literally bouncing down Magnolia Lane and watching the ball bounce. And the caddy is out there, and I just see his face. And he has to go out of Magnolia Lane and try to get the ball. And I'm, like, wanting to crawl under a rock and or just run away. Anyway, now, come on, do another one. And I did it again. I shanked. Anyway, I shanked two more balls in Magnolia Lane. And finally, I got the hook, and it pulled me off the range. But it was, like, the most embarrassing thing ever to be Jack Nicholas and Sam Snead and about a thousand people in the stands. And I'm literally, and they're, you know, they're all watching this kid who's out there. Why is this kid hitting balls? Right. And, and I'm shanking it. So I, yeah, I, as I mentioned, every time I drive down that road, I've fortunately can drive in there with my dad. And it's all I think about is literally, oh yeah. Remember those shanks bouncing in there. <laughs> Picture so, that ball just bouncing down. Oh, it was, yeah. yeah. They're like literally like doing like ping pong off the magnolia trees on the road, boing, boing, just, bouncing around and it, it was it was awful <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm picturing the caddy running side to side too yeah. just cursing you well, he was he was pissed i, I mean i look at his face because he was like what the hell is this because it was kind of dangerous because each caddy had their own little spot yeah and then the guys dropped it right in the little circle for him and you know i wasn't doing that <laughs> so anyway. did you did you go down a lot over the years i mean how, how many times do you think you've made it down to the masters you know as a kid, I probably went four or five times in my teens and then maybe a couple times when I was in college. And since then, you know, the 30 years since college, maybe eight or nine times. Is your dad still able to make it down? Yeah, he's uh, he was just down. He went this year for the, the uh, champions dinner during the COVID thing. He had to mail in a COVID test and go take a couple COVID tests, but he went again. So he's been, I think, you know, to that champions dinner since 69. So 52 years in a row. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Now, yeah, obviously I do the masters, like has been to Augustus, like, I don't know. I, th I think it's like 63 or four years in a row. Wow. That's insane. Now, with you being able to to see it from back in those years to everything that's happened, you know, up until recently with changes to the course and everything. First of all, with this this November Masters, I'm curious what your thoughts were on on that a little bit, and then also just as to changes to the course. What you you know, with these guys bombing the ball now, we kind of talked about this stuff and how it's it's a different game, and in that course. You know, definitely wasn't designed originally for guys to be hitting a ball 350 yards. Just curious if you have any thoughts on, you know, changes that they've made or ways that they could could even make it to where it's it's still, you know, obviously it was a challenge for the guys again, but, you know, you've got Dustin Johnson who went out 20 under. Yeah, and I think the greens being soft had a big part of that. Um, but I was a huge fan of what Augusta looked like before they had the quote second cut um this year it looked more like rough <laughs> it was pretty yeah. long um 
and it's always been rough, but you know, they have their semantics at Augusta that they use. I am not a fan of pretty much anything that they've done. I was, my thoughts are, and I'm probably tilting at windmills here, but Bobby Jones and Alistair McKenzie were pretty smart. And those two guys put their heads together and, you know, they both love St. Andrews and they built that place. And it was built to be a course for the members that also held an event for the pros. And they went about building something that worked for both. And by building really interesting greens and not a lot of bunkers, I think there were 18 bunkers originally. Wow. Um, You know, so I really love the concept of that golf course, just letting the terrain take the ball, the the short grass. If you hit it offline, it runs somewhere you don't want to be to come into the, it's a tough angle to come into the green. Um, The greens used to be firmer when they were Bermuda. So, you know, you couldn't hold a shot. And when you were hitting a long iron, you really couldn't hold a shot. But ever since, they tiger proofed it really was the start i mean they changed things up until then obviously quite a few times but it still to me was more or less the same place Uh, when they started tiger proofing it putting the trees on 15 between 15 and 17 there used to be no trees out there the trees on the right of 11 uh the you know, tree more trees on seven and lengthening that hole. It used to be a three iron sand wedge. And now it's like 490 yards long through a, you know, it's like the hallway of a office building. Um, I don't know. I just, and they, you know, they soften the greens a lot. You go out there and you, you walk on the greens and the guys are always, Oh, what'd they change this year? They're trying to figure out, but they're always t- like, I just remember going on the fifth green and it's got that really awesome false front and had these two cool little rolls in the green and they just keep softening those rolls. They just keep getting, you know, t- a little air taken out of them, so to speak. And everything just keeps getting toned down a little and because the greens keep getting faster, you know, and so you have to, oh, that slope's kind of unplayable when the green gets faster. Um, I know with guys hitting at 350, I don't know what you do, honestly. Um, other than just let them shoot 25 under. Right. Or don't, I mean, you know, do you call 13 a par five anymore? If the guys are hitting eight iron into it, it's, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, I, I really hope they do something that they can at least not let the guy, the drives don't go that far. I don't really, I don't know what you do to any golf course to challenge anybody to make it more than just a driver or short iron fest. You know, how do you, and if you're trying to make guys get long irons by making long par threes, that's no fun for you and me if a par threes are 240 yards long. So I have to, and it's like, oh yeah, we're going to make the pros. That's the only time we can make them hit a long iron. But it's like, well, yeah, well, it's a par four for me. So um, it's, it's a tough question. And, you know, ideally I just wish maybe we could go back in time and never let the metal wood come out. And if, what, what would have happened if that never, if you just were still trying to use a wood, you know, could guys have the same swing speed if you had to hit a sweet spot, the size of a dime. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, I don't know if you've put a persimmon club next to a 460 CC driver lately, but it's just like, Oh my God, how did I hit this thing? You know, yeah, I've actually I, got, got a bunch of my dad's old drivers. I took them out of his barn about three weeks ago. So I have, over here in the corner, I don't know, like 20 old Tommy Armour persimmon drivers. And, you know, they're beautiful pieces of art, really. But it's like, wow, those would, it takes skill to hit those things. And I'm looking at his old things and the fiber insert between the screws, there is literally a worn out spot about the size of my fingernail. And, you know, as a golf, as a good player, he was able to hit it in those, in that spot all the time, where I don't know that all the guys today if you gave them one of those clubs, if they could all hit it like that. Now, I'll bet you Tiger Woods and a few of the best guys, McElroy and a few could probably would be more, would actually maybe stand out apart from the remainder of the guys. That'd almost be a fun, that'd be a fun thing to, to see, you know, like like on one of these, one of these, you know, like they just had the, the match 3.0 or whatever. It would be a really cool thing to let four guys play with a set of persimmons or, you know, 
an old yeah. set of like, everybody uses an old set of Hogan irons from 19, you know, 65. Um, it would be very interesting. I don't know that the equipment companies will want to do it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool. You know, equipment companies on your thing. I don't want to get them upset. So <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. I mean, they call it the match, you know, kind of reminiscent of, of the book and the, the Ben yeah. Hogan. And, um, it'd be kind of cool to see him go, you know, play like a Cypress, but do it with the same clubs that those guys use. That'd be something. No, interesting. it'd be really cool. And there's a few other places you could go play that haven't been altered too much that are kind of still the same. It'd be really kind of cool to see, but Cypress would be a pretty great example of it. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you pitch that? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll see who I can talk to about that one. Uh, one last question before we get into kind of our, our little wrap up here um, is you were involved with Tara Edy and I've, I've only seen some pictures. I would love to hear from you. Like what, tell us a little bit about that course and tell us what, what makes it so special and, and why I've, I've seen such amazing pictures and, and people talking about it. Uh, the first thing that makes it special, just any great golf course that's kind of links in is the sand that's built on sand. So, and that's what the owner Rick Kane was looking for. He basically was looking around the world for a site that was sand and, you know, New Zealand was one of his prime locations he was looking and found this site and it actually was covered. I think we talked about this. It was covered in pine trees. It was a paper plantation. So it was pine trees every 10 feet, however far apart they planted the things, you know, it was just single file trees everywhere and you couldn't see anything. Hmm. So, you know, as the trees came down, you sort of got a little bit of like, Oh wow, it's better than I thought or whatever. And so that, the sand and then once the views the views on the the coastline that 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 location are just phenomenal there are these just i don't know unique as hell islands off to the off the coast with it just you know looks like the south pacific and it's just it's beautiful this beach out along the golf course is stunning um but i think what helps make the golf course it all sits on a slope going down to the water and i don't know exactly the percentage of the slope but it's just enough that all the holes feel like they're on the water. Cause as you're going down the slope, the holes are kind of above each other or looking down the slope. And it just, it just feels like you're right on the water all the time. You're mm. just, it's like a perfect little, just, you know, grade going down to the water. And then, you know, Tom's routing is fantastic. And it's one of those things where you said, you know, what do you notice? Well, nobody would notice there that a lot of the stuff that's there is actually built because the features, the small features, especially were gone when the tree clearing happened. And then you had to get rid of all the stumps, which they forgot about when they did it. I think we mentioned and say, like, oops, that's going to cost a little more than that. <laughs> and it also, because the tree clearing guys didn't get rid of the stumps, Brian Slonick, who ran the project for Tom Doak came up with the idea of taking all the stumps and there was a lot of them and digging two big pits and getting a ton of sand out of these pits and burying the stumps and then capping them. So there's two big dunes on that golf course that you would never know. I'm not going to tell anybody which ones they are, but they're a couple of big dunes that are basically bury pits for stumps. And wow. so there's some big features out there that were created and there's all the small features were created just because when you take the trees down, you don't have the little ripples and things that are in the dunes land. Um, so that, you know, that, and just New Zealand is awesome. <laughs> and so you combine all those things and it's, it's a beautiful golf course. When we were building it, we knew it was kind of insane how beautiful it was. But I remember going to Cape Kidnappers to go play golf while we were there. And I had, I didn't work on Cape Kidnappers for Tom, but you know, you'd seen pictures of that and what an amazing place it is. And it's just insane looking. And we had built nine holes at this point, Terry, or seven, maybe. And I, I was playing golf. So I was like, wow, Terry Eady's way better than this. And this wow. place, is, you know, in the top 50 in the world. And it's like, this place is boring compared to Terry Eady. And saying that about Cape Kidnappers is kind of crazy. But so that's kind of when we first knew it. And then we built it in two year, two winters, because the sand blows a lot and it's dry in the summer. So we worked in the winters and built the holes while it was raining and a little more, a little more, more moisture in the ground. And you could also grow grass better when it's not dry and blowing. So 
it was the cool part is we got to play the first the front nine while we were building the back nine because the course wasn't open but yet the nine holes are basically done so right. got a lot of golf in on the front nine <laughs> and um i don't know it's when we were out there just like man this is more beautiful i think than cypress point and it's a similar piece of land minus the rocky coastline holes of Cypress Point, you know, on the other side of 17 mile drive there. So anyway, if anybody gets a chance to go, go. It's it's worth a flight. It's worth whatever it costs to get to New Zealand. It's worth to go just to go to Terry Edie and plus you get to go to New Zealand. So wow. Yeah, I, I've heard nothing. I, I've seen some of the videos. Of, I think the No Laying Up guys were there and watched some of their stuff and it just looked – looks amazing and then when i heard that you were part of that it was pretty cool yeah it was uh you know i've had a lot of really cool experiences traveling around the world working um i mentioned one of the other interviews you know i got to live in north barrack building a renaissance club for tom doak we got to play north barrack the guys at north barrack were nice enough to let us play there every night after work and so it was light till 10 11 o'clock at night or later so basically got 18 holes in almost every night after work for a whole summer. And, you know, that was fantastic. I mean, how can you put a price on that? And, uh, you know, got to work over in other places in Scotland, but New Zealand was just a fantastic experience and fingers crossed. I get to go. Tom's doing another course there. Bill Corr is building a second course there now, and they're going to do a third and hopefully I can make another appearance down there. Wow. Well, if you need an intern, uh, I'd be happy to head on over with you. <laughs> if it goes much longer, I'm going to need somebody to keep me moving. So <laughs> there we go. All right, my man, I got a couple final questions just to wrap up. And I've, I've taken a lot of your time today, but uh, we, we ask everybody that comes on here, Caddyshack or Happy Gilmore? Uh, Caddyshack. I think uh, Ted Knight should get an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> If you could pick a walk-up song to the first tee box, what's your walk-up song? At this point, the way my game's going, I'm going to go with Help by the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I saw some swings. You still got some pretty good action. If you could play 18 holes of golf with any, I'm going to say, if you could round out a foursome with any three guys, past, present, or future, or, or future, past or present, who would those guys be and where would you decide to play? Yeah, you know, you gave me a heads up on this one. And I think, you know, we were talking about my dad being at the Augusta this year and his health's kind of gone downhill. You know, he's still he's still mentally fine, but just his body's kind of going down. And he hasn't been able to play golf for about a year and a half or two years. And so I'd almost like do it, just play with him, but like give, let, you know, since we're doing this hypothetical, let him go back. And I would actually like to play with him. I think he was... 30 what is he he was a you know 35 36 years old when i was born so he was older so i never really by the time i was 12 years old you know and he wasn't really at his prime i would have loved to go back and play with him when he was like 35 years old you see some old swings like holy crap he could swing um but i'm sure he would enjoy just being able to play and if maybe he could go probably with jay and jerry haas maybe just to get a chance to play with them again. Um, maybe go out and play Cypress Point. That would be a pretty cool place to go hang out. So uh, that'd probably be it. And uh, if it was just for me, I'd love to go play with William Langford, the golf course designer, on a couple courses he built just to see what he was thinking because he was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what what would uh, one or two of those courses? What what name? Oh, what I heard. Are they? Yeah. Um, the one I work on one that he, uh, I did do some consulting and work at West Bend country club in Wisconsin, in West Bend, Wisconsin. And that has nine Langford holes and they didn't build his back nine. They built a different back nine, like 50 years later. And if they would have built his back nine, it would be one of the top, probably like, top 50 course in the United States. Cause the front nine's nuts. It's really cool. Really? Yeah. But that course, uh, Kankakee Elks, I don't know if you ever been to Kankakee Elks. No. Andy Johnson of the Fried Egg talks about it some, but it's in Kankakee, Illinois. Like if you're driving to Chicago, you go past Kankakee sometimes. And there's this 18-hole course there that Langford did in his last course, I think, in 19, 
Lang last Langford Moreau course, 1933. It's phenomenal. And it's a $12, $15 municipal public golf course. And it's run down, but the design is phenomenal. It's so good. If you if it could get restored, it would be like a top four or five course in Illinois, maybe the best course in Illinois, even if it's just saying a lot, but it's that good. And wow. So I'd love to see what he has to say about that place. But I've been stopping in there since I learned about it. I've been stopping there almost every time I drive past it just to go play. So anyway, got sidetracked on your questions. No, no. Um, last one would be if you could get your – your dozer onto any course in the nation, what would it be? Where you could make you can make whatever changes you wanted to make. Wow. You know, most of the courses that I really like, I wouldn't touch. I'd leave them alone. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a dozer, but honestly, Cypress Point, playing that, it's like, oh my God, this is a fantastic golf course, but it could be so much better. The greens have gotten top dressed over the years and they've kind of like, they're all puffed up and they've kind of lost what I think were the really cool contouring. It's kind of all been just top dressed for so in California, they're open all year long. So like in the Midwest, we top dress maybe twice a year, you know, they're doing it four times a year, maybe out oh, there. Wow. So just the greens and the bunkering. I know they redid the bunkering in house, but it could be better. The mowing lines could be better. The trees could be better. I honestly think that course, as good as it is, could still be improved. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do it with shovels, rakes, and maybe a, a small excavator, not a uh, bulldozer. Nice. I like it. I like it a lot. Well, Kai, I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, I hopefully we get to uh, go swing the sticks again sometime soon. Yeah. Maybe maybe we'll take a little road trip up to what is it, Kankakee? Kankakee Elk. Yeah, actually. Uh, our our mutual acquaintances know it well so we'll have to uh definitely do that okay that sounds so. awesome well thanks again for for coming on is there a place where people can kind of go and find out more about Golby designs i know you said your website's been a little bit uh underdeveloped over the past couple of years but are you on social media anywhere people can check in on you oh you know what i'm on twitter and instagram but i rarely do much with it <laughs> but i'm there <laughs> um yeah, I may get my website up again someday here, but honestly, um, I don't know where you'd find me as far as on this this kind of world. Well, that that kind of goes right along with the theme of your your shaping. You're you're there, but people don't know you're there. So there that's, you go. That's perfect. Being invisible. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks again, Kyle. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Jeff. Thank you. I'll see you.